in our SEC filings, including our most recent report on Form 10-K. With that, let me hand the call over to Mark. Um, you know, this has been such a challenging time. Uh, you know, our uh, hearts have been, had broken. We've heard so many stories of uh, pain and distress across the world. And, uh, you know, um, uh, for us, this really, this moment is actually quite humbling, quite, quite bittersweet. You know, it reminds us that... Um, at Salesforce, business is the greatest platform for change. That we're really here. Um, to be a great example of stakeholder capitalism, to really show how we're able to deliver a phenomenal return for our, for our core values, but also about our core product. It, it's about showing how our customer 360 has been a platform. And I'm going to talk about that briefly. Um, but also our company being a platform for change. And I'm thrilled and also to our stakeholders. Certainly when we look at this quarter with more than $5.15 billion in revenue, and our highest operating margin ever, or when we look at, you know, just simple aspects of our operational excellence, like some seven-figure deals from a year ago, indicates to us one thing, which is that values really bring value. You know, it reminds, reminds me of a story that we really started last quarter. You know, AT&T is an amazing company, a leader in the communications industry, and they have a tremendous visionary with Jeff Mechelfesh, who is the, and I'll tell you the thing that's interesting about AT&T is that they have a huge vision. And that vision is that every single customer touch point, whether it's their stores, whether it's their e-commerce, their app, whether it's uh, getting a metal customer touch point, they want to know you as a customer. They want to have a single source of truth. And that's a deal that we saw. And I was thrilled that this quarter, hundreds of stores in the first 35,000 users. So at this moment in time, there's never been, there's never ever been a time when we've had to go faster. We've had to deliver customer success faster, and we've had to be there for our customers. And I'm absolutely thrilled. I also look at in the quarter with PayPal. You know, this is a tremendous organization that's really at the right time at the right place. So to see them have such great success with our sales cloud and our third CEO, Dan Schulman, embrace us so deeply. The one on one relationship, the journey. Powerful. You know, another incredible victory in the quarter has really been work.com. Here's a product that I don't think that's never been more successful, more rapid. Look at so many success stories. Public sector says today, in the middle of this pandemic, everyone needs contact tracing, they need shift scheduling, everybody needs a workforce command center, try to bring everyone back safely. Well, work.com is delivering that. Just look at the results at the University of Kentucky, for example. It's a difficult situation for a university. And I look at so many other customers and so many other success stories during the quarter, whether it was great public sector wins like the Veterans Administration or the state of Rhode Island.
personally a tremendous victories like Banco Brandesco. Just had a great conversation with their CEO, Octavio de Rosari. You know, tremendous vision for the future of financial services and how And ultimately, I guess the most proud I was during the entire quarter was when we delivered an additional $20 million to our San Francisco and Oakland public schools, bringing our total contributions to $118 million to our local public schools. But one thing that's so important right now is their need to be able to enter into distant learning. So it's that idea that we've been able to do well and do good at the same time, that this has really been a victory for stakeholder capitalism to show that, you know, we can build a great company, but we not only have great core values, but we have great core products. So uh, I just want to give my sincere thanks and gratitude to everyone who had such a great success during the quarter, our customers, our employees, our partners, all of our key stakeholders. And um, with that, I'd like to turn it over to Mark. Well, great. Thanks, Mark. And I hope everyone continues to be safe and well during this historic and challenging time. As Mark described, this was an exceptional quarter for Salesforce. Both the company and our customers navigated the crisis better than our guidance assumed. While the performance in Q2 leaves us optimistic about the future, it is important to note that we remain mindful of how the pandemic may continue to impact our customers and our community. Let me take you through some of the results for Q2, and I'll begin with the top-line commentary. Revenue was $5.15 billion, representing 29% year-over-year growth. Q2 was the first time in which the company surpassed $5 billion in a single quarter. Our revenue performance by cloud continued to demonstrate strength across the portfolio. Sales cloud grew 13%. Service Cloud grew 20%. Platform and other grew 66%, with Tableau contributing 41 points of that growth. And Marketing and Commerce grew 21%. Additionally, we had a strong year-over-year -year performance by region in constant currency. Amer grew 28%, with Tableau contributing 10 points of that growth. AMEA grew 38%, with Tableau contributing 13 points of that growth. And AsiaPAC grew 23%. Before I detail the quarter's performance, please note that the following should be compared against the guidance assumptions we provided on the Q1 earnings call. Specifically, the outperformance in the quarter was driven by five factors. One, better new business generation. Notably, uh, we saw Q2 business consistent with historical trends. Two, higher license revenue driven by new business performance. Three, modestly better revenue attrition than expected. And four, achieved certain uh, performance obligations within last quarter's large telecom transaction in five favorable foreign exchange. Our remaining performance obligation representing all future revenue under contract ended Q2 at approximately $30.6 billion, up 21% year over year. As a reminder, this metric includes both new business and renewal contracts. Current remaining performance obligation, or CRPO, which is all the future revenues under contract that is expected to be recognized as revenue in the next 12 months, was approximately $15.2 billion, up 26% year over year. CRPO benefited from new business outperformance, favorable foreign exchange, strong renewal performance, and the inclusion of last quarter's large telecom transaction. Q2 GAAP EPS was $2.85, and non-GAAP EPS was $1.44, the outperformance in the quarter was driven by higher revenue, as well as realized and unrealized gains on a strategic investment portfolio, notably due to the Encino IPO. These mark-to-mark -mark adjustments benefited GAAP EPS by approximately 55 cents and non-GAAP EPS by approximately 58 cents. GAAP EPS was also benefited by $2.17 as the company changed its international corporate structure which included the consolidation of certain intangible properties, resulting in a $2 billion net tax benefit related to foreign deferred taxes. Please note that this had no impact on non-GAAP EPS as the company utilizes a fixed long-term projected non-GAAP tax rate 
which generally excludes the effects of discrete events. Turning to cash flow, our operating cash flow was $429 million in Q2, down 2% year over year. CapEx for the quarter was $114 million, leading to a free cash flow defined as operating cash flow less CapEx of $315 million, up 22% year over year. Now turning to guidance for Q3 and fiscal 21. Coming off of a strong Q2 result, we are pleased to be raising our full year fiscal 21 revenue guidance to 20.7 billion to 20.8 billion, representing approximately 21 to 22 percent growth. This guidance includes approximately 100 million of revenue from our acquisition of Velocity. For Q3, we expect our revenue to be 5.24 billion to 5.25 billion, representing approximately 16 percent growth. As a reminder, Q3 represents Tableau's fifth quarter at the company, and therefore the year-on-year -year growth rate will be normalized. While the demand trends were strong in Q2, we remain mindful on how the pandemic may continue to impact our customers and community. Therefore, our guidance assumes that the revenue attrition remains consistent with Q2's actual performance and assumes we deliver modest new business growth during the second half of fiscal 21. We are taking this quarter by quarter as the pandemic is not over and we are only halfway through the fiscal year. In that mind, uh, from that perspective, we will continue to evolve and reimagine our business to enhance our relevance and deliver the highest level of customer success and innovation. As we look out over the next 12 to 24 months, we realize it's important for us to make a strategic shift and in investments today to better position our company for continued growth and customer success in this new all-digital, work-from-anywhere environment. As part of this, we'll be allocating resources to prepare the company for growth in strategic areas. This means we'll be redirecting some of our resources to fuel growth in areas that are no longer as aligned with the business priority will be de-emphasized. Furthermore, we intend to accelerate spend in go-to-market and product originally planned for next year and pull that into the second half of this year. These investments in growth are planned and they will increase our expenses in the second half. With that being said, after incorporating these and updating our revenue guidance, we're pleased to be able to raise our fiscal 21 non-GAAP operating margin guidance to a year-over-year -year improvement of 75 basis points. As a result, we are updating our fiscal 21 GAAP diluted EPS to be $3.12 to $3.14, while non-GAAP diluted EPS will be $3.72 to $3.74. For Q3, GAAP diluted EPS is expected to be 3 to 4 cents, while non-GAAP diluted EPS will be 73 to 74 cents. As a reminder, our EPS guidance assumes no future contribution for mark-to-market -market accounting as required by ASU 2016-01. For operating cash flow, we are raising the fiscal 21 guidance to 12 to 13 percent year-over-year growth. We continue to expect CapEx to be approximately 3 percent of revenue in fiscal 21 resulting in a free cash flow uh, growth rate of approximately 15 to 16 percent for the fiscal year. Operating cash flow is expected to be impacted by these incremental growth investments. We expect CRPO to grow approximately 19 percent year over year in the third quarter. And as a reminder, Q3 represents Tableau's fifth quarter at the company and therefore the year and year growth rate is now normalized. To close, we delivered a landmark Q2 in the face of adversity and have set ourselves up for a strong second half of fiscal 21 and beyond. We are proud of our ability to successfully lead through change and above all, to continue to serve our stakeholders around the world. I'd like to thank our employees, our customers, our partners, our community, and our shareholders for their continued support. I wish each of you, your families and your firm safety and wellness. And with that, we'll open up the call for questions. At this time, I would like to remind everyone, in order to ask a question, please press star, then the number one on your telephone keypad. If you would like to withdraw your question, please press the pound key. And your first question comes from Heather Bellini with Goldman Sachs. Please go ahead. 
great. Thank you so much, gentlemen, for taking the question. I appreciate it. Um, I was just wondering, Mark or Mark, um, if you could share with us a little bit how the progression of the quarter unfolded and, you know, just, just kind of what you're hearing from customers now. Obviously, you did much better than what your guidance expected. But, you know, if, if you were to, you know, put all this into Einstein, what, what, what it, how did it shape up versus what you were versus what you thought? Again, just thinking about how the slope of the quarter might have progressed. Thank you. Well, thanks, Heather, for that question. You know, we started this quarter, 54,000 remote employees working at home. Um, we knew that we had to make a number of changes. We knew that it was going to be critical for us to reshape our company, um, that this was a moment in time that you basically had to make a decision. Are you going to keep things the way they were, or are you going to change? Are you going to shift? And we made a decision that we were going to change and we were going to shift. We shifted our operational values very aggressively. And as we changed those operational values, we started to see momentum built. Um, we called that out on the beginning of the uh, call after T1, where we saw pipelines starting to increase for the second quarter and the third quarter. And it really was that as we piled in and doubled down on these core operational values, we got much closer to our customers. We understood that if we were going to succeed at a moment like this, we were going to have to be closer to our customer than ever before, that we we're going to have to change a lot of aspects of the, fun the company. And as we made those, as we made those adjustments, we saw the speed increase right up to the end of the quarter. And that was just really powerful. I mean, as I said, this moment is both humbling and bittersweet. You know, this has been such a challenging time for us, for our families. Um, and then to see these amazing results, it's just, you know, incredible. I mean, honestly, I just can't believe everything from just the delivery of all of our teams. The technology teams just did a fantastic job. The engineering team. You look at what happened with work.com. I mean, it's incredible. And it's been so important for so many businesses to get back to work safely. But now that we've brought it to schools to help schools get back to work safely as well, we're doing that, you know, in a, in a paid, paid fashion. We're doing that in a nonprofit fashion. So this is, this is really a moment where I think values bring value. This is about us really paying attention, as I said, to our core products and our core values. And that was, that's really the accelerator. And when I look at some of the success stories that I went through, I mean, there, there's so many. But one that's been very powerful for our whole company is watching what Gina Raimondo has done at the state of Rhode Island. She's even addressed the entire company. You know, this is an amazing governor of this incredible state. She came to us and said, you know, if we're going to make our state safe, there's things that we're going to have to do. Of course, everybody's going to have to wear masks, but we're going to have to increase our testing. We're going to have to be doing tracing. We're going to have to be moving to shift scheduling. I need a command center. I need to do all these things. And that our teams are able to deliver and help her and 35 other states and so many others, that's very, very powerful for us because – we, we all want to get back to how things were, but the reality is that's never going to happen. We're in a new world. We're in an all-digital world with the work digitally. We're living digitally. We're educating digitally. And that, that means we're going to have to make these adjustments. And, uh, Brett, do you want to just talk about you know, that and how the engineering organization has kind of responded? Yeah, Mark. I mean, it's interesting. You talked a lot about transformation and reshaping our company. We're just seeing that across our entire customer base. And you're seeing it in how our technologies are being applied. Um, just some incredible numbers. I think one that's very illustrative, in the past six months, the use of messaging channels like text and WhatsApp and Apple Chat has gone up 600%. Uh, we saw an 89% year-over-year growth in our commerce cloud. Uh, probably a great example, a great customer story, I think this really illustrates this, is Sonos. Uh, this is 
and the customer of Sonos, I use it to, to play music at my house. Like so many developers of product, they had to go direct to consumer. They deployed our marketing cloud and our commerce cloud, and they saw an almost 300% year-over-year increase in direct consumer revenue as a consequence. And you know, I think that it's been an incredible trying time for all of our employees, all of our communities, and all of our customers. But as you implied, there's also just incredible, sustainable, enduring shifts in consumer behavior like the um, digital commerce and this move to go direct to consumer. And so it's a great privilege to be able to help our customers navigate this crisis. And as you said, one of the key values we're trying to uh, represent as a company is that agility uh, to listen deeply to our customers like Governor Raimondo, like Son Sonos, and making sure that we're empowering all of them with a customer 360 so they themselves can navigate this crisis successfully. Gavin, we just had a tremendous uh, meeting with um, Banco Bradesco, with Octavia de Lazari. You know, we've also met with so many other customers. I met with one of your customers late last night in um, in uh, in uh, France. It was uh, it was a morning for them. You know, yeah. huge CPG company. I mean, we're seeing so much transformation with the customers, and you know, a desire for speed, and also. They're all paying attention to their ESGs as well and aligning, you know, from a position of stakeholder capitalism. Gavin, can you give us some illumination about, you know, what you're seeing from the customer base? Uh, well, I'd call out a couple of things, Mark. Um, one is, uh, and we did touch on this in the last in the last call, we saw confidence build week after week as we went through the quarter. Um, and the shock of, you know, uh, closing down and moving business so that it would be managed remotely. You know, once the first couple of weeks um, had been uh, had passed, we saw companies begin to realize that uh, the digital transformation was an imperative um, that they just couldn't afford to put off any longer. So I think what we saw with our, our sales leaders is, um, and, and the products that Brett and the team put, together for us was we were relevant. You know, that was the, the key word, I would say. We were able to pivot very quickly. Um, it was a very agile um, performance from, from the company. And we were there to help our customers through these difficult periods where they had to make decisions that would typically, you know, take weeks and months, sometimes in days. Um, but it, I think it, it demonstrates what a, a powerful a proposition we have for customers um, that we can spin things up quickly like work.com. We can deploy um, the core clouds very quickly and they deliver quickly for customers. Um, that means that actually our relevance now is, is probably uh, as high, if not higher than it's ever been. And, um, you know, I, you know, we had a great course. There's no question about that. But I think it's tinged with a, a slight sense of, um, the context in which it's been achieved in. Uh, but, uh, you know, there's real, I'd say, real confidence in, in the business. We're not getting carried away. Um, there's no question about that. There's still a lot of uncertainty as we look into the second half of the year. But undoubtedly, what we offer is something that uh, increasingly our customers really want. Well, thank you, Gavin, and welcome, by the way, to the team officially. I know you've been with us now for about a year, but now you're officially in the role of running uh, as our chief revenue officer. And we couldn't be more thrilled, and uh, uh, we're absolutely delighted to uh, have you as part of the team. Amy, you, we also saw a lot of action in public sector. I mentioned a few of them, um, but there were so many more stories. Could you highlight a little bit about what we saw in public sector during the quarter? You're on mute, Amy. It would not be a call if I did not forget to take myself off mute at some point. You know, I think the public sector has been a great success in both the first quarter and the second quarter. And it's that type of trust and collaboration that just keeps building. I have to give a real a shout out to Dave Ray, our president of the public sector, and his entire team. And some of the things that stood out to me were not just Rhode Island, but really seeing the team mobilized in other states. We would have a reach out uh, saying that they didn't know what to do. They were struggling. 
And within hours, they would have pulled together a team of professionals from across Salesforce and said, this might be a new situation to you. This isn't new to us. We know how to do this. We know how to uh, deploy a team quickly, and we can get in there and partner with you. And it was terrific to see. And I thought it really um, showed just the values of Salesforce and our focus on collaborating and partnering with governments around the world. Very good. All right. Thank you so much, Evan. Your next question comes from Alex Zukin with RBC. Please go ahead. Hey, guys. Thank you for taking my questions. I uh, hope you're all safe and well, and, and congratulations on an absolutely stunning quarter. Mark, I, I guess when, you know, a lot of questions we get these days uh, around the improvements uh, in, in kind of week by week that Gavin just referenced around the confidence and the relevance is what, what can you tell us about your pipeline uh, and, and your confidence in converting that pipeline, particularly in selling in this new digital world, you know, where with a you know maybe a virtual dream force or or some, yeah. You know, how do you think about that? And then how does that set the stage? If you think about the 2008 recession, you know, you guys accelerated pretty meaningfully coming out of it. And I, and based on that pipeline question, is there a scenario in 2021, given that increased relevance? Is it possible to see a meaningful year of acceleration, or are we just still too far from the end of this uh, crisis? Well, this is such a great question. I, I really appreciate it. You know, I guess this is the third major crisis, or maybe fourth, that I've been through as the CEO of Salesforce. And, um, you know, in each crisis, things are different. Uh, but one thing that isn't uh, different is that each one has been an accelerator in the future, that each crisis tends to bring us to the future faster. And that uh, appears to be what's happening here. Look, I'm speaking to you from my home. Each of my executives are in their home. I'm looking at a screen that looks like the Brady Bunch with little video images of all of them, you know, Gavin in London and, and Amy, you know, uh, in San Francisco and so forth. And um, it's quite complicated. Uh, you know, that um, we're, we see these continual advancements and accelerations. But you have to, as a CEO, take a moment and ask yourself, how are you going to change? I kind of alluded to that. And I think that your question about Dreamforce is so important because, you know, I can't tell you how many people I get on the phone with, well, when's Dreamforce? We're, we're ready for Dreamforce. But there is no dream force in 2020. We know that. We're not all heading to San Francisco next month. We're, Metallica is not playing. You know, we're not all going to be going in the keynote room. And, yeah, we're grieving that. You know, there's a grief. There's a sadness that we're not all together. We love being together. As one Ohana, our employees, our customers, our investors, we have a big investor day. You know, we're all in a big room at the St. Regis Hotel and, Mark Hawkins is holding court with everyone, and there is no such thing this year. You know, so it's 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 sad. And uh, will we all be back together again? I hope so. Am I sure? I don't really know. I mean, this is my first pandemic. I mean, we're in a global pandemic. We're we're dealing with a uh, virus that is has a lot of unusual characteristics. So we've made changes at Salesforce that we now are advising our clients to make how to get their employees to participate. So we have 54,000 employees. For us to achieve these results, everybody has to be on the field and playing the game. You know, we have to also give them the incentive to play, to train them, to keep them motivated. You know, I think I've mentioned this to you before, but, you know, every week since the pandemic has started, we've had an all-hands call where we have all 54,000 people on a telephone call or a Zoom, and we're talking to them around the world and giving them like a play-by-play -play for the week. That hasn't happened since we were like a 10-person company, a 100-person company. That's what little startups do. That's not what companies who are entering the Dow do. That's, this is like, whoa, this is like a moment. So, you know, we're reimagining our business. Also, we've had to reimagine our relevance. That's why we built Work.com because we realize that our customers need us to show up to be relevant to them. That's why we built Salesforce Anywhere, 
because we realize our customers have to sell and service and market anywhere. That's why we built the Leading Through Change program. You may have noticed we put over 200 million people through Leading Through Change, far bigger than anything we've ever done with Dreamforce. I just watched the one that just happened. It was amazing. And many other things. I, you know, it's another level of enablement, for example. Like, do you know that a third of our employees are reporting mental health challenges? I'm sure a number of people on this call are having mental health issues or know people who are having mental health issues in this pandemic. That's why every day we've been doing a Be Well Together call. If you go to YouTube, you'll find mental health resources. We've never had to publish mental health resources before. At this velocity and this scale, it's amazing. You know, or I think I mentioned to you, like, we bought 60 million pieces of personal protective equipment. We didn't know what personal protective equipment was. It's amazing. We also retrained everyone with Trailhead to become a ranger. And we're doubling down on that, making sure that every employee is trained. You know, the Tableau, which, by the way, I don't know if we mentioned it. I mean, with such a genius CEO, Adam Salipsky, who runs that. And uh, I think it's going to be the best acquisition ever done in the history of the software industry. Most successful, certainly. Um, and, you know, they built this incredible data hub. If you haven't seen it, you should go to Tableau Data Hub which you can find on public.tableau.com, which has amazing visualizations of everything that's... And I just mentioned to you that I, you know, just did a major, you know, uh, uh, management team presentation digitally uh, in Europe. I, I mean, we're constantly talking to our customers in new ways at scales we could never have imagined. So it also gives us the ability to have accountability with our distribution organization, which is a scale. We're not a subscale organization. We are a scaled enterprise software company. We are able to compete effectively as evidenced by these numbers with any enterprise software company that's on the field today. And we're able to manage our distribution organization and go to market in ways that have a level of acuity that we did not have before. I mean, it's powerful. When you add it all up, participation and enablement and relevance and the tactical plays, and then the values that we apply, our core values, well, we're a different company. This has changed us. The pandemic has changed us. We're not the same that we were. These aren't even the same players on the call that we're talking to you at the beginning of all of this. So that's really amazing, and I think that these results are evidence of that and where we'll be a quarter from now or two quarters from now or a year from now or two years from now we don't know but our intention is the same which is we're helping our customers to connect with their customers in new ways we want to be the number one crm we're the number one in analytics we're tightly focused we're not all over the field like a lot of our competitors by the way a lot of our competitors are everywhere you know they're in every market but some of them are in enterprise and consumer they're not just in CRM, they're in CRM, they're in ERP, they're in public cloud. I mean, we're not. We're singularly focused so that when we pick up a call, for example, like we mentioned, like from a Dan Schulman at PayPal, and he says, I need sales cloud, I need service cloud, I need to integrate everything together. We're going to do that for him. Or if we look at our success with CVS this quarter, we look at the tremendous, their leadership team is incredible, you know, just amazing executives and their uh, how they've come together with Edna. So powerful, but their return ready product. And then the integration with work.com, that's an imagination I have never had. And the vision of John Roberts and how he's been able to show how this pharmacy can actually be a key player in the pandemic. They're doing a hundred thousand tests a day. This is awesome, but they have to have each one of those tests is an on-ramp for customer success. So we have to be there with a vision on how to help that happen. And um, I guess another one that really is on my mind has been VF Corp. I mean, I love vans. You know, I wear the North Face almost every day, those jackets, fleeces, and it's cold where I am. And I, I'll tell you, um, I think it's our largest commerce cloud deal ever. Maybe not customer because, you know, we tend to talk about deals and then we forget about how big these other customers are getting. But it's a great company and they're doing amazing things. 
I also was especially impressed with how, you know, Under Armour flipped on our commerce cloud and flipped off the old technology uh, this this quarter. That was really powerful. I mean, th- we have to act with a level of speed and capability with our customers that we've never been called on before. So, look, it's continuing to unfold. We all know that. We're doing the best that we can. You know, our hearts are with those who are going through serious challenges. So very much, this is a, a moment that is very much humbling and bittersweet. And we just continue to focus on business is the greatest platform for change. Our products have to be that platform for change. Our values need to be the platform for change. We know what role we play in our industry. We know that we are a, um, a light and that we have to continue to be that light, especially during these difficult times. Your next question comes from Taylor McGinnis with Deutsche Bank. Please go ahead. Hi, thanks for taking my question and congrats on the awesome quarter. Um, so the raise in the full year operating uh, margin improvement guide of 75 basis points I thought was really solid considering one that you guys are pulling forward some expenses to fuel growth and guiding to revenue growth in the mid-teens and the back half. So curious if you're able to break down the components driving that guide, like how much is coming from t and savings perhaps you saw in 2Q or expect to see further down the line and Wondering if you're able to quantify the pull forward of expenses. Yeah, thank you, Taylor, for the question. Appreciate that. You know, we were very pleased to to be making the, the raise of 75 basis points in the midst of everything, especially in the fact that we're you know further investing to really per, you know perpetuate this long-term success for our customer uh, and serving all our stakeholders. So I think uh, you know I we're not prepared to you know quantify the specifics of that, but I think you've got it right. We're investing in growth areas. Think about product, think about go-to-market in particular, uh, in terms of the uh, further acceleration in the investment, I think is, is a good way to frame that. Uh, of course, we're getting some teeny benefit uh, as well, but again, our profit level is a choice. And that's an amazing thing about our business model. We're making a choice in terms of where we want to strategically invest. We've shown in Q2 how we can deliver you know, what we delivered, uh, which is a record operating margin, but we're also trying to balance growth and profit over the long uh, long place. So that's our that's our approach. I think you nailed it in terms of some of the things, and we're really pleased to be able to both raise and make the investments. I hope that helps, Taylor. Your next question comes from Phil Winslow with Wells Fargo. Please go ahead. Hey, uh, thanks, Mr. Jim McEwarder, and congrats on a uh, re- on really strong results. I really want to drill drill down into some of the specific clouds, you know, specifically uh, uh, service cloud you can, that continues to you know, deliver just really robust growth. Uh, and obviously, uh, you know, last quarter became the biggest individual cloud, and th- that continues to stretch that gap. Can you talk about some of the, the dynamics that you see in there in service cloud, and how do you think about the sustainability of this on a go forward basis? Well, sure. Let me just touch on some of that at a very high level, and then let me ask Brett to come in as well. But you're right. Service Cloud had a record Q2. You know, it continues to grow at, a, you know, 20%. I don't know. The numbers are huge. The revenues are huge. The growth rate is huge. It's now larger than sales cloud. It continues to grow on all fronts, including, you know, year-over-year revenue growth. You saw that. New innovations. Um, the engineering team has done a fantastic job. The products are amazing velocity has added a lot to service cloud. They have built a lot on service cloud as another layer of value on on service cloud. And in the last six months, the use of messaging channels on the platform grew more than 600%. I think that Brett really illuminated that in a powerful way. You know, this idea of bots growing at 176%, cases log per day, 33%, quarter over a quarter conversations at nearly 19 million per day during the quarter. And, you know, it's a key part of every deal we do because when you're building a customer 360 and you're building a single source of truth for your customer, the service cloud has to be part of it. There's plenty of companies that have customer service or help desk or service desk or whatever as bespoke isolated solutions. But that's not our vision. Our vision is to be able to bring together a customer 360 because, look, like for AT&T, the salesperson in the store needs to be able to work with the field service professional at home, has to work with the service professional in the call center. It's all interrelated. And that's why PayPal, for example, is able to get done because 
It's sales and service together, by the way, combined with marketing, combined with all their other systems through MuleSoft, combined with analytics with Tableau, you know? So anyway, Brett, would you like to come in here and like illuminate your vision around that? Yeah, Mark, I think you characterized it well. I mean, fundamentally, our customers are coming to us to build a customer 360, that single source of truth for their customers so that in the face of unprecedented change for their customers, they can transform their business. They can go digital. They can integrate sales and service. It's really that single source of truth. And it's the anchor tenant of the customer 360, and I think that's where the momentum's coming from. Uh, and, you know, when you look at the, some of the deals Mark talked about, like PayPal, you know, it is really the anchor tenant of the value proposition of that customer 360. Uh, another great example that uh, Gavin mentioned in our last earnings call is Standard Bank. Uh, you know, it's, again, a complete solution for the largest bank in Africa. And, you know, one of the things that uh, I think is really powerful about that story is probably one of the most impactful calls I've done with Gavin in this past quarter was we were talking to their executive team. Um, and the executive team all the way down is actually becoming rangers on trailhead. They're using the service cloud and the customer 360 as an opportunity to not just transform their technology, but transform their culture uh, to become customer centric and really become a platform. Um, they're rolling out trailhead to all 50,000 employees with the goal of achieving 20,000 rangers. Um, and I really do think that this really illustrates the power of these stories around digital transformation, the power of customer service really being the centerpiece of that customer 360 transformation. Your next question comes from Walter Pritchard with City. Please go ahead. Hi, thanks. I'm um, wondering a uh, similar question in, in, in that vein on, uh, on Commerce Cloud. I know, you know, customers pay to some degree on, uh, on GMV and they have to come back and, and uh, you know, uh, re-up as, as volumes go up. Can you help us understand how Commerce Cloud, just the impact of Commerce Cloud in the quarter and how that's driving um, product, you know, sort of a holistic sale across the, uh, across the portfolio? Brett, can you, uh, can you take that for us? Yeah, Mark, uh, we saw over 100% uh, year-over-year GMV growth this past quarter, and I think it really reflects the broad digitization of commerce. Um, and, you know, I think when I look at, you know, our commerce cloud and our differentiated value proposition, it's two things. You know, one is we do both B2C commerce and B2B commerce. And I think that when I talk to customers, it's really about all of their channels. Um, it's their direct consumer channels. It's their uh, warehousing. It's their partnerships. And we're really the one platform that can do both. The second thing is the integration of our commerce cloud with the rest of customer 360. I think everyone on the call has experienced uh, buy online curbside pickup, right? We've probably all experienced that, many of us, for the first time. When you think about the technology that facilitates that, that's the integration of our commerce cloud, our order management solution, service cloud, and really that end-to-end -end customer experience. Um, so you're right that uh, GMV is a good indicator of growth of the commerce cloud, but I also want to be clear that our commerce cloud is really a part of a broad solution that we're providing to customers to really digitize their commerce experience all the way from making that order um, through the end of that customer experience, whether you're picking it up on the curb or it's being delivered to your doorstep. And those transformations have never been in more important in this all digital work from anywhere world. Your next question comes from Cash Rankin with Bank of America. Please go ahead. Hi, thank you very much. It's absolutely spellbounding to see, finding to see organic growth rate, this solid margin expansion, et cetera, and the leading indicators, RPO as well. My question for you, Mark, you sounded really excited about Tableau. You made a very profound statement that it could end up being the most uh, uh, impactful acquisition for certainly Salesforce, maybe in the software industry. As you look at digital transformation, customer 360, help us paint the picture of what a Tableau can do for customer 360 and digital transformation for the industry looking into 2021 and 2022. Thank you so much. Well, I really appreciate that question because I'll tell you that uh, we're so fortunate to be able to acquire Tableau last year. It is the, one of the world's leading enterprise software companies, probably one of the most loved brands. The ability to see and understand data, the ability to build these compelling visualizations like you see in the public domain, like at public.tableau.com. 
But I think the parts that you don't really know are that when we talk to so many companies, they've gone wall to wall with Tableau. And doing those types of deals, that's very exciting because Tableau is analytic for the rest of us. You know, we were always in the analytics business, of course, you know, either through Sales Cloud, which had dashboards and reports, which were great, but very much, you know, about kind of basic reporting out of Sales Cloud. Or we had Einstein Analytics, which is incredible, but it's super advanced AI, highly programmatic and very enterprise class. This is a, you know, this is a capability that means that every company can deploy analytics easily. It's a simple, easy to use, and easy to understand product. I'm sure a lot of you use it. Plus, you can build these amazing visualizations. Plus, it has this incredible culture, this brand, this community. They call themselves the data fam. Um, it's, it's awesome. And they are an incredible group. And they also delivered a great quarter, which impacts us. Mark can talk about how that impacts us. Um, but let me tell you how it hit, impacts me. It's when I talk to somebody like Bob Merritt, who's the CEO of PwC, which was one of our largest deals of the quarter, but it's also when PwC says that's going to be our new analytics platform. And so many conversations with so many companies who have made the decision that now that Tableau is part of Salesforce, they see – how this has become part of our customer 360. And there's a lot of new innovation, a lot of exciting stuff coming for Tableau. And um, you, you'll see that, you know, with their incredible uh, uh, incredible announcements that are coming. But, Mark, will you just fill in, how does it impact us on a financial basis? Yeah, Mark, I'm happy to do so. And I also share the excitement about Tableau. It's just such a great company that, to serve our customers. Uh, one of the things that was nice this quarter is Tableau, you know, overperformed uh, with their um, uh, with their offering and their particular uh, term license offering. Uh, you know, they had uh, a number of really uh, nice deals with the uh, various customers who wanted to go even beyond one year. Uh, you know, we call it multi-year, and when that happens, that uh, you know further uh, helps us in the sense of uh, uh, the revenue recognition. Uh, and uh, but all in all, it's all driven by people liking the product, wanting to invest not in just a year, but in a couple of years. And it, and the more years out, Mark, the more you know we you know we see that benefit in the top line. Uh, but what also is exciting for us is is how it integrates into the digital transformation. So it's been very positive. And it was a very nice performance for sure. Congrats to the Tab Tableau team who's listening in today. And I'll also just. Say say, well, and I think, Mark, you know, I'll come in here for a second, MuleSoft. You know, we're yeah. two years into MuleSoft. You know, here's another, this has been a game changer for us because it's the heart and soul of Customer 360. The ability to say to customers with authenticity, we're going to integrate everything for you and bring in all your legacy systems and put API on them and give you this tremendous capability. These two companies together, this is a huge accelerator on our business that they're both working so well. Mark, can you, can you extend that thought? Yeah, definitely, Mark. Uh, in fact, again, MuleSoft also was a contributor to our overperformance. Uh, again, uh, people love the product, Mark. I, I like the, the dialogue you mentioned with the VF Corporation where they're buying multiple products, including MuleSoft, to, you know, to get that that 360 uh, progress, if you will, of the, of the customer. And for MuleSoft, again, nice uh, overperformance. So all of our MuleSoft uh, team members, congrats to you as well and your contribution to this uh, result in Q2. Uh, and when they're, again, selling you know, more term licenses, this, this again, has a, a favorable effect on us and, uh, and, and, most importantly, helps us solve problems that customers really need help with. And, Mark, if I might just add, whether it's MuleSoft or Tableau, or even our core products, one of the things that you know we certainly hear more and more uh, is this whole notion, and Gavin talked about digital imper imperative, it is very clear uh, that our products are becoming more and more mission critical. MuleSoft, Mark, is adding to that. Uh, MuleSoft is adding to that 360 solution, and we're becoming more mission critical. Uh, and one of the effects, Mark, that that had in this quarter is our attrition rate was better uh, than we had expected. 
and uh, and and that's in part because we're becoming more mission critical with MuleSoft with the integration of these 360 products and and just the sheer over performance of MuleSoft and Tableau contributing to our results. Your next question comes from Remo Lenshaw with Barclays. Please go ahead. Hey, uh, thanks for squeezing me in, and congrats from me as well. Um, question for Mark and Gavin. Um, in this new environment that we are living in, can you talk a little bit about what you're seeing in terms of customer engagement, in terms of deal size that you kind of kind of maybe targeting, but then also like we talked earlier about Dreamforce being kind of more online, like you know, Dreamforce always was a big event for lead generation, etc. Like, how are you shifting that, and you know, that maybe kind of uh, bring in a little bit of the comments about the go-to-market investments. Thank you. Brett, would you like to take that? Yeah, sure. Um, so, uh, you know, one thing that I think Mark talked a lot about is we're really focused on having a beginner's mind with our business. So as Mark mentioned, this is all of our first pandemic, and the way we're doing business is completely transformed. Uh, all of our um, sales engagements happen via Zoom rather than being in person. And, you know, when I, I talk to a lot of customers about their own digital transformation, I always try to guide them, don't translate your analog behaviors into digital media. That's not a digital transformation. That's a digital translation. And when we think of things like Dreamforce, as Mark said, I, more than anyone else, I'm totally bummed out we're not going to be in San Francisco uh, in October or November because it's one of my favorite times of the year. But we really feel like we demonstrated over this past quarter our ability to reimagine the way we engage with our customers in completely new ways. Um, I think Parker made a comment in the last earnings call that stuck with me where he said, you know, on one hand, we're all staring at these screens and it feels so impersonal. On the other hand, I'm staring into all of my colleagues and customers' living rooms, and it's oddly more personal at the same time. So broadly what I'd say is our ambitions to transform our customers uh, with the success of our technologies, our customer success teams, our distribution teams, um, has not changed. And in fact, I think there's a broader imperative for digital transformation than there ever has been. The way we're going to change, engage with our customers has completely transformed. And I think as a company, we really think we've developed over the past uh, quarter that mindset of a constantly transforming and reshaping ourselves to be able to meet our customers where they need to be met. Uh, and I think we have the ability to continue executing on that with humility that predicting the future right now is really hard. Uh, we're in the midst of an unprecedented environment. But I think we've developed a lot of confidence internally at our ability to transform ourselves. Your next question comes from Sarah Hindley and Dowler with Macquarie. Please go ahead. Great. Thank you so much for taking the questions. I'm squeezing me in. Mark B, how do you feel about M&A today and all of this back and forth going on around TikTok? Do you think the M&A appetites are picking up or just the IPO market? Um, and then a more specific question on the quarter. Look, the resilience here is really impressive, but so is the margin delivery. And I understand the balance of growth and investment and the commentary made, but could these better margins be a bit of a new normal given work from home? And then just last thing, I wanted to say that it's really nice to see you be generous to your employees and still reward your other stakeholders, namely shareholders. Well, thanks. I mean, certainly we're seeing an, a very interesting environment in the markets, in M&A, and IPO. I think that for a company like Salesforce, you know, we don't really see an M&A environment. It, it, these are not... You know, it's we're not in a moment. I, I honestly feel like we're very lucky that we were able to pick up MuleSoft and Tableau when we did because they were both public companies. Uh, today, you can do the math. We would not have been able to buy them. There's no way, no how. It wouldn't have worked for us financially. So we're not in a good M&A environment. I, I just don't see it. Maybe things could change, of course. Things always are changing. But I think, you know, this isn't part of our plan right now. We don't see that. We really see focusing on our business, focusing on these operational values, executing our business. Look, we always maintain a beginner's mind. You know that. But the reality is right now this is about our own execution. We've made these two major plays to extend and complement our, our customer 360, and that's what we're focused on. 
Let me take the second uh, part of that question, Mark, uh, on the uh, growth and in investment and could the uh, margins uh, be the new normal? Uh, thank you for the question, uh, sir. We, you know, always are mindful of, you know, we want, you know, obviously growth number one. We want to continue to expand our operating margins and, and deliver cash flow. We know how th uh, critical those three are, financially speaking, and we're always uh, trying to balance that. Uh, we're always making choices with the opportunities in front of us, and uh, you know, we are, are always reassessing that at the at the executive suite. So uh, we are pleased to be raising. Uh, we, you know, we're always trying to be better. Uh, we're always trying to keep a, an eye on that and going forward. But we think we have the right balance for this year, uh, given uh, the opportunity, given the uh, total addressable market that we're, you know, you know, uh, so well positioned for to serve our customer and the rest of our stakeholders. So we think it's the right balance today. I take your point, and we're always assessing, and we're always trying to be better. That is all the time we have for questions. We'll turn the call back to Evan Goldstein for closing remarks. Thank you for joining us on the call today. If you have any follow-up questions, please email us at investor at salesforce.com. And look forward to speaking with you on our Q3 results. Thank you.